Hello, everybody, and welcome to the final academic session of the day. And in fact, the final academic session of this year's uh, virtual Heidelberg Laureate Forum. Uh, this will consist of a panel discussion between four laureates who will be uh, focusing on the question, where can computer science and mathematics interact fruitfully? We, of course, have representatives from both maths and computer science, and we're very much hoping that everybody uh, will be joining in as well. And so please do send in your questions and uh, we will be putting them to, to our panelists. Um, just in case you happen to have missed all of the other sessions today, um, just to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Tom Crawford. I'm a mathematician at the University of Oxford, and I also do various things on YouTube uh, with my channel, Tom Rocks Maths, and also recently with Numberphile. Um, so we've got four speakers in the panel, as I mentioned, so I'll try and give, uh, well, try and keep the introductions as short and sweet as I, as I possibly can. So uh, in no particular order, uh, first up, we have Alessio Fugali. Uh, Alessio is based at ETH Zurich and was awarded the 2018 Fields Medal uh, for contributions to the theory of optimal transport and its applications in partial differential equations, metric geometry and probability. We have also uh, Madhu Sudan, a computer scientist originally from India and now based in the US at Harvard University. Uh, Professor Sudan was awarded the 2002 Navan Lina Prize for contributions to several areas of theoretical computer science, including probabilistically checkable proofs, non approximability of optimization problems, <laughs> that's a difficult thing to say, and error correcting codes. Our third panel member is uh, Efim Zelmanov. Uh, Professor Zelmanov was born in the Soviet Union and moved to the US in 1990 and now resides at the University of California, San Diego. He was awarded the Fields Medal in 1994 for the solution of the restricted Burnside problem in group theory. And for the fourth and final panel member, we welcome back uh, John Kleinberg, who just uh, gave us a fantastic talk and discussion. Uh, and just as a short reminder, uh, Chris Kleinman was awarded the, the Nevelina Prize in 2006 and the ACM Prize in Computing in 2008. So to begin the discussion, my first question to the panel is, where can computer science and mathematics interact fruitfully? You're on, you're on mute. So I, can... I wanted to suggest that our new Van Lina Prize winner speak first. Uh, also, maybe they can explain what is computer science? Uh, what's the difference between computer science and mathematics? It's a matter of definitions and it's a matter of distance from which you look at them. I would be very oh. to know. Yes. John, you want to go first? Uh, I'm good either way. Um, sure. So, I, yeah, of course, great. It's a great question. And um, I've been on at least one uh, meeting, you know, where uh, it was supposed to be a two day committee meeting to produce a report of some sort. And we got sucked into the question, all of us computer scientists, <clears throat> to try filling in the blank. Computer science is the study of blank. And uh, actually, I believe Madhu was on this committee also. And we spent the better part of a day. Uh, debating this, it's reassuring that many other fields would have similar difficulties, uh, arguably mathematics would have a similar difficulty in, 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 in filling in that blank, also in a way that there was some consensus about. I'm, I do think in terms of, you know, com com computer science, you know, so there's something tautological about saying that computer science is the study of computational processes, um, that might not be a very useful thing to say, but it certainly, the, 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 the idea of algorithms and their properties is is certainly something at the at the, at the heart of computer science you know uh, understanding the properties of algorithms as well and i think also that computer science is on the boundary um with engineering disciplines right there's an engineering component to computer science that you know we analyze the properties of of algorithms we treat algorithms phenomenologically but we also attempt to build out um and i think you know there are some similarities with It's, 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 it's executing within some formal system that we set up. Um, unlike other disciplines that use 
mathematics. I, th I think what's you know what's 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 particularly interesting is that, in some sense, the, necess the necessity of formalization is forced on us. In order to write a piece of code, to do something in the world, you need to formalize the part of the world into code. The only way you can actually communicate the state of the world into the code that you're writing is through some decision about formalization. And so, computer scientists are by necessity making decisions about formalization all the time. And in that way, you know, you might distinguish them from physicists or chemists or economists where the phenomenon they're studying at some level would be going on with or without their attempts at formalization. Uh, not, arguably not so with computer science where it's, it's our decision to formalize, to build. And, and I think that's the sense in which it, it, it sort of sits between mathematics and, and the engineering disciplines. So there is this kind of intake activity. Um, and then I think, you know, there are a, a lot of opportunities. I, I think one of the one of the sort of deep kind of activities with, within computing is to take take questions that seem initially am, am, amorphous that relate to to algorithms or to data, and to try giving them a formalization. So the question of, you know, what uh, what does it mean to compute efficiently, um, uh, which is a, a question that obviously Madhu has contributed. In, enormously too, you know, what can be, you know, how do we divide tasks over multiple computers? What does it mean for patterns to generalize from existing data to unseen data? What does it mean to communicate securely? All of these are questions that I think people have asked for, for centuries in an informal sense. And uh, I think one of the goals of computer science is to really try engaging with mathematics to, to, to make some of these precise. Uh, to follow up on that, uh, one big difference that I see, I mean, you asked the question, what's a dividing line between computer science and mathematics, maybe? I think of computer science as an applied mathematics discipline, and uh, that doesn't mean everything we do is applied or applicable, but it does mean that it influences a lot of our choices. And I think uh, this is both a good way to separate what uh, tends to be considered computer science type questions from pure math questions, but also a good way to think of building a bridge between the two fields. Um, I am struck, I was struck by the title of a course that a colleague of mine once taught at MIT. The title of the course was uh, uh, Applied Mathematics for Pure Mathematicians. And if you think about it a minute, I mean, you say, oh, I have never seen this direction of interaction, but it's a very fruitful direction of interaction. Um, computer science typically tends to get, it, get its problems, the computational questions, the mathematical questions that it generates are from explorations of algorithms or algorithmic processes, but they often lead to innovative questions in the mathematical fields. They are different from the ones that have been traditionally studied, but then often we find that once we've thought about them enough, talked to enough mathematicians, we are able to morph them into questions that they have traditionally studied. Some of these came out of pure mathematics, Hardy's example of uh, uh, number th uh, of algebra or number theory, I think, I, I don't remember which one was one of the notorious ones where we thought this was a di discipline which was purely the, you know, definitely the purest and it ended up being very applied and it was not a coincidence that the application came from computer science. I believe computer science today captures a vast majority of the applied questions that mathematicians are facing. And uh, the interaction has been very fruitful in both directions. Uh, just like <clears throat> pure mathematicians can learn from applied mathematics as to how to ask a question, how to solve a problem. Uh, <clears throat> it's also the case that uh, we often learn in applied mathematics how to apply things that we already know by looking at what pure mathematicians have done with this uh, kind of uh, vision and thinking. So often the, the main difference is we often tend to carry a fair amount of domain specific knowledge about the area of application. This is not untrue about mathematics either. You, everybody specializes in something. In our case, the specialization is often related to something which is uh, an application around which you can maybe build an engineering uh, 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 in artifact. Um, and that has probably been one of the big uh, uh, lines of demarcation. So maybe I will go on oh, and then I think you can conclude. <laughs> no, I, I wanted to ask further questions. Uh, okay. To, to prove, you know, what distinguishes mathematics from all other sciences is proof. 
as criterion of truth. What's the attitude to proofs in computer science? So I would be very happy to keep going on on these topics, but I do also want to hear what you folks have to think about it. Uh, but uh, on proofs, um, we in computer science or some of us in computer science often think we understand proofs better than mathematicians do. If you are supposed to prove correctness of an algorithm, this is by far the most prescribed uh, prescriptive way of uh, writing a proof. These are, you know, these are the you know, gold standards of proofs. They are actually verifiable even by an algorithm, which is something that we would like about all proofs. Uh, a lot of theoretical computer science is driven very firmly by the fact that we ought to accompany whatever we are doing in, in terms of proofs. And this includes performance measures on algorithms, uh, guarantees on correctness, uh, and all kinds of different things. We are very careful about separating, I think, much more so than many of our physics colleagues, for instance, much more uh, careful to separate our axioms from conclusions. And uh, when we think something is a heuristic, we say that very clearly. We have known factorization algorithms for integers, which are heuristic. They are not really proven correct. And there are others that we actually prove to be correct. So, uh, so we are very careful about that. The attitude towards proofs is like that. That being said, there are cases where we were looking for a solution that works today. We are unable to model the question carefully enough or understand the model from which we come. We create a heuristic model. We create a heuristic reasoning process, just like saying every number is a, a prime with probability inverse in the length of the, in the number of bits representing the number. It's a good heuristic, but it's certainly not true. Uh, but it helps drives lots of uh, 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 analysis and number theory. We find similarly uh, heuristics which drive analyses in uh, computer science, which are not formal proofs. If I may just follow up on that with, with a question, perhaps uh, on the topic of proofs for, for the mathematicians, uh, is, is that um, what are your thoughts on the role of, of computer assisted proofs. So I personally remember talking to um, a mathematician, Thomas Hales, a couple of years ago, um, who just had his proof of the Kepler conjecture about packing. Uh, I think of it as the packing oranges in a box problem. Um, the most efficient uh, way to do that, to pack spheres in a, in a, in a container. Um, and it took a very long time for his computer assisted proof to be accepted. And I just thought it would be interesting to get the thoughts of the mathematicians on the role that computers can play in, in proofs of this type. Okay, I can start. Um, maybe, uh, so it's interesting. I would just like, so I will reply to this question, just in the context, I will just try to follow up also the previous discussion about the the role of, uh, you know, the fact that, the, you know, there is this important improve and the, there was the discussion that in mathematics, uh, I mean, that maybe computer science is even some aspect more rigorous. It's funny because, you know, in mathematician very often for us, you know, proof is fundamental. There is, no, I mean, unless you check everything and you have a theorem, it doesn't matter much. Uh, but uh, it's funny that, you know, for a, I guess from a computer scientist, uh, you will say, oh, but, give me a bound which is computable. And very often mathematician, have, there exists a constant such that, and we are super happy when sometimes we have bounds which are a bit abstract. So there is a bit of different way of at attacking sometimes some results and what we really need. So as a mathematician, we are less worried about the, the immediate application. But, um, you know, the proof part, um, my view is that, you know, a proof is a proof. So of course, if you do it computer assisted, it's still a proof. I mean, uh, the difficulty very often actually is to reduce to something that you can do with a computer because uh, very often you have infinitely many cases and you need uh, a lot of you know, deep ideas to reduce to a situation where you can use a computer. Then there is the, uh, you know, the, the beauty aspect. How beautiful is a computer system proof? Uh, as a mathematician, uh, I don't find it beautiful, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, <laughs> you have to do what you can. And I think uh, the fact that we can do that, I think is very good uh, because sometimes, you know, you don't just have no clue how to find an elegant proof and still you will get the result. And I, I think sometimes when it 
one needs also to be pragmatic. So I think that's, I mean, I'm in favor of that whenever there are. I was, uh, there was a talk that uh, uh, was given in some recent joint event also with computer scientists, mathematicians, and uh, there were people, mathematicians who started to believe, to say that they expect computer assisted proof to kind of get a predominant role because computers now are learning better and better how to prove mathematics theorem and they really can become, you know, more and more efficient. And uh, when I was listening to that, I got scared. And uh, I tell you why. I believe that, um, you know, the level of abstraction that you reach after a certain amount of, you know, research in mathematics is very difficult for a computer to reproduce. But reality is that when, you know, as a student, they start to get the first exercises and the first problems. And, uh, you know, you spend hours, sometimes days, weeks to try to solve an exercise that the professor gives to you. Um, it's good that there is no shortcut in the sense that, you know, suppose that I have to solve an exercise and I don't know the solution. I just, the only solution is just to try as much as I can. And then if I'm unable, I ask to a friend. But then if I just can write the, the question in the computer and the computer is gonna pop up in one minute, you know, the, the proof printed on my desk, then the temptation is to be quiet. I mean, I would be super tempted to do that. And then if you start to do that with your uh, PH, first PhD problem, right? The advice will give you a problem and then uh, it's a warm up problem. And then you just, your warm up problem that can be solved by your computer, then it's very difficult to, to train yourself. So it's uh, the fact that, you know, you have too much so that scares me a bit, the fact that uh, computers can help us too much because you could misuse them as, uh, you know, at the beginning. But besides that, uh, you know, I'm in favor of every kind of cooperation between the brain and computers. I think, uh, you know, it's good for progress of science. So that's, that's good. So I think we should support each other. <laughs> Maybe Efim can comment as well. Uh, well, I think that uh, computers can be of great help when you need to do some big computations, like in Kepler problem. I am a bit more skeptical about uh, computers checking proofs, because look at the proof like Perelman proof of Poincaré conjecture. It was, it's just on the limit of uh, human abilities uh, to do a proof. In order to write it in a, in a way that computer can check, Oof, such a huge work. Nobody will do it. Perelman certainly won't do it. Mm. So from that point, and besides, the purpose of a proof is understanding. Understanding, tracking it to some big general ideas that imply it. If computer tells me that the proof is correct, but I don't understand why, mm. And who will check the computer? I don't know if uh, uh, you folks were around, uh, I remember a couple of years back, I don't remember, two or three years back maybe, another HLF where we had a similar panel discussion. Avi Vigdeson was on the panel at the time and he had a response to this question, which was very nice, I thought also, sort of along the lines of what Alessio is saying right now, which is if, I, if there's a theorem I really, really care about or a proposition that I care about, turns out I can find a proof with a computer assistance, I would be very happy to get that. If you can give me a beautiful proof on top of it, that's bonus. But I can't always demand both. These are each, you know, the truths of the statement I would like to know. If it is a statement that I, whose truth I care about, then I would like the proof no matter what, how ugly it is, how uh, brute forced it is. And if, on the other hand, uh, I'm using the proof for further insights to build my own uh, abilities, then, of course, it has to have the additional feature of being elegant and uh, human verifiable. Uh, that being said, um, there have been cases where we have run computer programs. I'm not, by the way, I'm one of the worst at running a computer program. It wasn't my doing, but one of my collaborators was doing this. We ran computer programs in order to search for certain proofs. And the algorithm actually found amazingly beautiful proofs, which we could actually prove to others that, oh, look, this is clearly, obviously a proof. And this is the proof from the book. It just so happened the algorithm found it. You know? 
I think it also, it says that it, it's very hard to s separate these questions about proof from the, the human nature of, uh, of doing mathematics or the human nature of doing computer science that ultimately all the, each of these fields is a, <clears throat> is sort of a sociological activity in, it, in itself. And so, you know, obviously mathematics is not just an enumeration of ordered pairs of statement comma proof, but that we're trying for some kind of human understanding. You know, so like, as you said, Alessio, like, you know, even at the level of training, we're, we're trying to develop our own understanding so that we can use understanding to solve new problems. And and that's something that sort of, so it it is sort of hard to approach this question abstractly without the sort of human nature of, of I think, both of these fields. So we've got a um, another question, uh, which has just come in, which I think is sort of referring back to the the original discussion about the, the differentiation between uh, mathematics and computer science. Uh, which asks, well, which says, uh, many computer algorithms are based on algebra, abstract algebra, topology, and so on. How do I properly differentiate between mathematics and computer science? So I know we touched on this a little bit, but I just wonder if it's if it's worth just perhaps talking about in some way how those topics are, are used in, in computer science. Um, might, be a, might be an interesting discussion point. I think it's not easy, right, to distinguish. I mean, I think it's fair. It's a fair question, right? Because we have, of course, you know, within mathematics, very often you have the applied people, the applied math and the pure math, which is still in some department distinguished. So, um, and especially you have the computational mathematics, let's say, I don't like too much applied pure, but you have com people who do computational math. That, so probably then the question is, uh, how to distinguish between a computational mathematician or uh, a computer scientist. And sometimes it's very different, difficult, right? Because you have re people who are really at the interface. Then, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you would think a mathematician is more on the, also on the abstract level and not always worries that much about the, uh, the, the applicability in a computer and be the computer scientist can go further and become closer to engineering. But uh, of course, you know, it's a continuum. It's like uh, you have a, a continuum of people starting from the pure ones, then more applied, and uh, there is no real uh, separation line. So there are people who could be in both, like in a university, could be in both departments, and there is no reason why they are in one or the other. So it's fair. How, how do you probably differentiate? Is, is it so important? Uh, you know, uh, I think more and more, technology, the, the current technology, I feel that is pushing us actually to merge more and more mathematics, computer science. I mean, instead, in our uh, university at ETH, we always had that joint bachelor program, math physics, because traditionally mathematics and physics were being close together. And now we're developing a, a math computer science uh, client courses, which, and it's natural, right? We, are, we heard a lot, maybe in the last years, talking about artificial intelligence, and then, that's of course something which influences a lot of people. I mean, it's very uh, you know uh, dear to computer scientists, but uh, people in statistics work on that. Uh, people on numerical analysis work on that, and then in fact there are so many theoretical questions that come up of that that are related to partial differential equations, that are related to uh, probability, and so in fact it's a, really again a continuum of uh, the spectrum. So in fact. Um, you know, um, I don't think, I mean, it's diff there is no distinction that much at the interface, I think. Uh, and it's good that more and more, uh, you know, there is also cooperation because that's also, I think, a positive. Uh, we, need, we need each other, I think it's good. Computer scientists bring a lot of exciting mathematical problems, uh, also theoretically, and, you know, there is that the reality is that we won't have all the developments of computer science that computer science has seen in many years without the math behind it. If we think cryptography, you know, it came from, it lose a lot of number theory, or answer, a number theory from the 17th century. And then after cryptography started to use elliptic curves. So things from, you know, tools from algebra as they come and justify. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a nice word where <laughs> we, we, we move on together without even knowing sometimes that we are <laughs> doing the same stuff. That's my view on the question. You know, one of uh, my teachers, Sobolev of Sobolev Spaces, once said that you don't need the formal definition of hippopotamus. You come to a zoo, you see a hippopotamus, and you know that this is hippopotamus. 
sometimes when, in, when I hear talks about string theory in physics or complexity theory in computer science, I have a feeling that this is mathematics. <laughs> Yeah, if I can say, I mean, I'm delighted to hear you say this, FM and also Alessio. Uh, I don't think it's really a, uh, um, a absolute difference between computer science and mathematics. It's more a social difference that we've created. Uh, computer scientists tend to pursue certain questions in mathematics deeper and have very shallow knowledge in others. Uh, Mathematicians pursue certain questions and mathematicians are not homogeneous, they're also heterogeneous. And once again, you see the depth of exploration in some things much more than others. A concrete uh, instance of an example where, you know, computer scientists have looked at questions somewhat differently than maybe mathematicians traditionally is algebra. I teach a course on applied algebra uh, occasionally. And this course, even though it's aimed at undergraduates who are barely able to learn very elementary abstract algebra includes a lecture on how to factor polynomials over finite fields. Now, this is not something that we teach commonly in a algebra undergraduate course. Uh, at least I'm not aware of one in the math department which does that. Uh, why? Because naturally being algorithmists, we have to ask the question not only that the polynomial factors uh, whether the polynomial factors are not over a given field, but also how would you find the factors if it does? So the how aspect of questions often gets amplified when computer scientists look at it. Well, may I ask a question, Madhu? When you give uh, such course on factorization of polynomials, do you give proofs? Uh, the aim, uh, depending on the level of the student, I do. Uh, if it is a uh, student's Graduate students in computer science, I definitely give proofs. Uh, and if it is undergraduate students in uh, applied mathematics, I probably will not do it. But I think in all these problems, you know, I think the, having statements with proofs is the, the gold standard in theoretical computer science, the, as it is in mathematics, as, as, as Madhu was saying. I mean, in a way, the, 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 if we take all of computer, right, there's a question whether we're talking about theoretical computer science or all of computer science. And, and certainly, you know, if we look at all of computer science, there's a vast expanse where people will do things through computational experiments. They'll, they'll, they'll find heuristics that, 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 that seem to work well. But even there, there's this con, con, continual expansion of the parts where proofs can be provided. Because even when we say experiments, you know, when a natural scientist says experiment, they mean something taking place in the world that may or may not ever be able to be formalized. When we talk about computational experiments, it's something taking place within a system we built that's completely well-defined. And so there's always the in principle opportunity to actually um, prove statements about, uh, about what's happening. And um, it's, I find it surprising how much of that territory, you know, so parts of machine learning that originally seemed completely heuristic increasingly become formalized increasingly you see proofs of statements that you know the that the following update rule converges with high probability um things of this sort and so i think the there's sort of these two waves in which computer science progresses there's the experimental heuristic wave that goes out in front and the the part that, that fills in proofs but the aspiration is to 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 fill in proofs as much of it as possible okay thank you everyone for your thoughts um we've got another question uh, which has come in, which says, what is your take on classical logic versus constructive logic? Who would like to start us off on that one? Say that I don't really know much about either of those fields. <laughs> uh, that, so it's always a question that, you know, I mean, computer science does uh, have very close connections to logic, but it's also been um, uh, something that's, a reserve of the select few. So I don't know that we, uh, despite our origins from logic, if we are all very um, uh, heavily invested in it today. So maybe I'll let, it, let others take, uh, take this question. I'm quite I also with some contradiction. You know? <laughs> Mm 
but uh, you mentioned machine learning as an example. Yes. Is it mathematics or computer science or engineering? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I agree with uh, something which, uh, Alessio, which I think I understood you to say, which is that if we're in a zone where it's hard to tell the distinctions, then potentially the distinctions don't matter as much. Um, you know, it, in the end, it may not be crucial if something is mathematics or computer science or engineering. Um, I do think machine learning, you know, or statistics, right? I mean, that that's the other, you know, if we want to start parsing areas and area boundaries, we, we could ask where, you know, is, is statistics a subset of mathematics? Is it uh, disjoint from mathematics? What's its relation to machine learning? But all of these would become increasingly difficult and potentially less crucial questions. I, th I think in, in machine learning, what's, what I think it has really helped power the field forward is that there is an engineering component to it where, where people build artifacts and, and essentially use a, a experimental methodology on held out data to see how their algorithms do, right? They, they separate data into training sets and test sets, look at out of sample generalization. And that's, that's, the, that's the standard of evaluation. And then there's a, a theoretical component of it, um, you know, building on work of Leslie Valiant and man, many others that, you know, tries to formalize the act of generalizing from training data, uh, prove, proves theorems. And um, there's been a rich inter interaction between these, you know, and you, you, you have phases where the methods that work best in practice um, are methods where we have um, proofs of everything, you know, so support vector machines when they were in the ascendancy was, a well-developed theory that had a lot of, you know, had, had had proofs for sort of almost all the main things around. Now that deep learning is in, in the ascendancy, you know, we have a lot of things that we can achieve through stochastic gradient descent that um, we don't necessarily have proofs of guarantees for what's happening there. You know, it's clear that, and in fact, there are things that we even find surprising that they should be working that are working. And over the, 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 the the last couple of years, you know, both from the theoretical side through work from people like Sanjeev Arora and many others, as as well as from the more applied side, which has filled in a lot of mathematical insight, we're starting to understand better what's happening there. But it, um, you know, so I think machine learning has these two hemispheres that constantly interact, the, the, the part that provides proofs for some subset of it and, and the part that works experimentally, again, with a standard of evidence, but that standard of evidence tends to be out of sample performance on held out data. Okay, we have a um, another question. There's nobody seems to fancy the one about logic, uh, <laughs> which is fair enough. I mean, it's I, I personally don't know much about logic either, so uh, I'm not sure even I can't even add anything uh, to that one. Um, so the the next question we've got uh, discusses um, data science. It actually asks, what is the difference between data science of applied mathematics and mathematics of applied data science? Which to me just sounds like a rearranging of words, but it is perhaps does raise an interesting um, question about where does uh, data science and data analysis fit into um, this this sort of discussion between mathematics and computer science? Yeah, I mean, I think the comments on machine learning are relevant there. That you know, obviously, we should bring statistics into this into, into this picture. Um, and again, we can all debate where statistics is. I mean, at some point, this taxonomical activity of fields, while fascinating, you know, is somewhat incidental to the main purpose of sort of, you know, discovering new truths, making progress, you know, um, on uh, on some of these hard problems, which I think all, all of these fields can uh, collaborate in, no matter how they get renamed or or, or reshuffled. Um, I do think, you know, data science, you know, to the extent that that, that term has become um, something people have, have found trying to use. It, it sort of maybe combines three ingredients that are traditionally found in different fields, you know. So one is, um, you know, the question of prediction uh, from data, you know, which we see in statistics, we see in machine learning. Um, one is concerns with questions of scale, right? That we, we'd like to do this, but we'd like to do it constructively at very large scales, uh, something that we see, you know, from computer systems and, and from the engineering side. Uh, and three, people tend to think of data science as operating in deep engagement with some application domain. Right, so that if, if I'm doing, you know, the data science of, you know, wildlife or habitat management, for example, then I should be working with somebody who is a, you know, ecologist and evolutionary biologist, someone who's in that domain, so that I'm not doing it sort of uh, de novo. And I think when you have those three things, you know, a sort of focus on 
prediction from data, a concern with scale, and an engagement with some domain. That's often the three ingredients people bring together for data science. Um, right, and different parts of those have, you know, I think more projection onto mathematics than others. Great. Thank um, and does anyone, anyone else have, have anything else to add? Mm -hmm. What? That's okay. I was just saying, is this, if you have anything else to add before I fire away another question. You know, a, any big practical problem, uh, like a nuclear project, sending a rocket to the moon, or now big data, has many sides to it. Mm, big mathematical side, what we now would, would call computer science, engineering side. And so it's, it's normal that they all coexist and just interact there. My, um, my next question sort of follows up on that, in, in fact. Um, so I was, I was just, maybe just out of personal interest, and I'm, I'm hoping the audience may also be interested in this as well. So of course, um, we, we have yourselves from, from these various disciplines. So I was wondering if, if any of you have any experience uh, of collaborating either as a mathematician with computer science on, on particular projects you've worked on or as a computer scientist working with a mathematician. And if you could perhaps talk a little bit about if you have that experience, sort of um, the, the benefits um, of that as we're here, we're looking for fruitful interactions between the two disciplines. So well, I can reply, I don't know, I can start. Uh, so yeah, to me, it did happen recently. I started uh, collaborating with some colleagues. Some, I mean, so some students are at computer scientists at ETH, and others are working at IBM Zurich. So it's a situation where, you know, um, in that case, okay, they're working on quantum neural networks, and uh, essentially their goal is to convince people that quantum neural networks are better than on quantum neural networks because that's what they work on and uh so then you are you can start to discuss what does it mean that you know a neural network works better in a situation uh, with, in some situations with respect to another one um and then uh, you have to come up also with maybe some meaningful definitions of what does it mean that something is you know is more efficient than something else and uh there are many ways of doing that, uh, but for instance, uh, some things that some objects that have been brought up in, in this formalization is what is the dimension of a neural network. So how many parameters really are involved? So that's not obvious because, so mathematically these neural networks essentially is, uh, you know, you have a bunch of, uh, well, mathematically, let's say, you, the neural network essentially is connection between uh, what are called the neurons. And in some sense, you are just, have, parameters, so coefficients that you have to adjust. So to let your neural network perform a task, which could be, you know, recognize numbers. And essentially, so you have, you have several degree of freedom at your disposal, which is just adjusting coefficients in, um, in matrices. And, but the, the point is that very often, uh, you know, you are, you have more, you have more freedom than what you can really do it's a sense that you start to move parameters, but they, they're not independent. So the reality is that maybe even if you have a lot of degree of freedom, the kind of the real dimension of the space that in which your parameters, in which your network lives is lower because not every variation really acts on the network, uh, which is related to questions like overfitting as well. So essentially, you know, you have to decide really how many parameters there are, even if maybe you are allowed to change a thousand coefficients, perhaps the number of real parameters that you're creating is, you know, more like 50. And how do you capture that? And uh, this looks a bit like, how do you find the dimension of a set? And in mathematics, we are used to do that, right? We have a, a set, which is maybe not as essentially a, a smooth set, some strange, weird set could be fractal and many things. And in mathematics, we created so many notion of dimensions, Hausdorff dimension, Minkowski dimension. I mean, this is classical mathematical theory. And then we have a lot of applications. Once you understand how rich, how big is a set, you can then understand better how, you know, uh, these many properties of the set uh, uh, behave. So that's a moment where, you know, you, it's not 
it actually works rather well because you put together maybe some mathematicians some computer scientists and uh, you start to discuss and everyone has his own viewpoint uh, but you can come up with nice uh, ideas and uh, also nice works for me it was a novelty i is you know this kind of interaction is very new to me i mostly work on pure mathematics but it's fun so that's my experience anyone from from computer science perhaps do you have any um experience working with with mathematicians perhaps on on collaborations i think i mean uh i personally haven't collaborated uh, deeply with any mathematicians though i mean i think i constantly have conversations with uh, lots of them about topics of our interest and so on a recent exploration in a related feel uh, something that re relates to uh, works that i do uh, led us to uh, led a group of researchers in israel notably alex lobotsky uh, and others to start defining and exploring a concept called high dimensional expanders in fact one of his motivating thoughts was really oh this relates to certain con concept of error correcting codes that computer science uh, uh, computer scientists have studied uh, though there were other motivations and uh, it's always been uh, the things that i would say about these kinds of interactions are they are very slow to start because there's a huge language barrier there is a huge um, uh, uh, difference in both uh, modes of thinking and uh, utility functions what we actually consider a valuable result over here or, or valuable notion of progress can often be different and uh, on the flip side when you even even if you don't solve the problem when you end up understanding what it is that motivates the other set uh, i think we learn a lot and this has been uh, my general experience there have been more than one such situations in all of these cases i would tend to think that unless we are somehow forced to be in the same building for a long time together it may be hard to come up with an active collaboration uh, but there are people who've managed to i mean i can easily see chains of length too that you know somebody with whom i've co collaborated actively who has collaborated actively with somebody who's in a fairly non uh, i mean i don't count interactions with combinatorialists as interactions with mathematicians they are already halfway close they're probably closer to computer science than other fields but uh, other uh, you know even remote areas of mathematics i don't see that the number of hops needs to be very large one person that i collaborate with might have collaborated with them fantastic um, thank you very much. And um, <clears throat> something else that um, it wasn't really a, a question necessarily from the audience, but but something that that I spotted, which I thought would be quite an interesting um, thing to bring up into the discussion. Uh, somebody was talking about the the problem of P versus NP. Of course, one of the uh, the Clay uh, Millennium Prize problems in mathematics, uh, but yet perhaps seen more as a computer science um, problem. So I just wondered if you, you had any thoughts or, or comments around around that in, in general. Actually, a good question is, I would be very curious to think what FM and Alessia know about this problem and what they think about this problem. I mean, we understand the problem and uh, do think it belongs somewhere in between mathematics and computer science, but I'm wondering if the uh, feeling is reciprocated. I think it's a mathematical problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, well, it's, it's a mathematical problem uh, with essentially, at the, but I agree there is a lot of interface with computer science. Computer science. Uh, myself is too far from me, to be honest. So I never thought about it. I mean, uh, I don't have a say on that. It's related to computer science more on, on philosophical side. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, it's at this point, it's it's a mathematical question. It it draws its motivation from computer science. It's worked on by <clears throat> by by complexity theorists whose training is in, in theoretical computer science. And so, 
again, sociologically, it, 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 it sits within the core questions of computer science, but if I look at it syntactically, it's, it's a mathematical question. Thank you. Um, I think at the moment we're actually out of audience uh, specific questions. So, so based on our uh, discussion so far, and as we're sort of drawing into the last sort of 10 or 15 minutes, it's possibly a good opportunity for, for yourselves as the panelists, if there's anything that, that you've heard so far or anything that you yourselves have, have thought about or, or anything that sort of made you think during this discussion, which you would now sort of like to, to sort of put to the panel uh, yourselves, then please feel free to do so. Very well, quickly, I would say. A lot. Sorry. Okay. I want to say that I just learned a lot. It was <laughs> to hear your thoughts on what is mathematics and what computer science. So I started uh, this uh, discussion with questions that I was always interested in. Uh, and to me, I'm very favorably impressed with the fact that there is a greater understanding and appreciation of computer science from the mathematician colleagues here. Uh, it is not, as, as John also pointed out just now, it's not as if the questions are clearly of one type or the other. P versus NP is a good example. Syntactically, clearly a mathematical question. Sociologically, very much in computer science. Up till now, though, you know, society does evolve. Um, I th uh, there were times maybe like, you know, 20 years ago when we say, how can computer science and math interact? The natural uh, reactions would be, uh, yes, you know, computer scientists can implement mathematical formulae and solve their problems. And yes, uh, mathematicians could occasionally use a computer to search for something. There was uh, less of a deeper intellectual uh, 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 connection established. And clearly from this conversation today, I feel it's not the case anymore. So that's very uh, reassuring. Yeah, I think it's been an amazingly, I mean, it, it's been a, a, a great set of developments to watch over the past 20 years, exactly the progression that Madhu was describing, where I think, you know, people are sort of less concerned with exactly where the boundary is. And there's a, there's, there's a lot of interaction and, and questions that come up in computer science um, I think, you know, uh, we get the insights of math mathematicians who are just over the boundary, you know, who are, who are thinking about them. And it, it's always been amazing to me, even in, in very applied areas of computer science, how, you know, you, 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 you make up a set of definitions that make sense from a computer science point of view, and you do this in programming languages, or you do this in distributed computing, and you, and, and the, 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 the motivation is entirely about the application, you know, and I, um, and yet, when you go to characterize the behavior of the computational system, it turns out there's some some definition in pure mathematics or some theorem in pure mathematics that sort of fits sort of frighteningly well. I mean, so when I entered graduate school in fall of 1993, one of the things people were excited about was a theorem that uh, Morris Herlihy and Nir Shavit had just uh, had just had just proved about which 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 tasks are achievable by distributed processors that run asynchronously, that, that, that can't agree on a shared time and that uh, sort of can't coordinate their behavior. Some tasks can be solved, some tasks they just can never coordinate. And um, as Morris and Neer, you know, described it, this was a problem that had existed for a decade or more. It was defined purely by distributed computing people, not with an attempt to reverse engineer some mathematical statement out of it. But, but the question was ultimately mathematical, with, you know, can we characterize the tasks that are solvable within this model of computing? And, you know, as they sort of worked out examples, they found that like in their pictures, the processors seem to be chasing each other around some sort of a, some sort of a hole in the space of, of you know, configurations. And they, they formalized that by actually building simplicial complex, complexes out of the views that the processors had. And the characterization turned out to be about, you know, essentially the contractibility of some, of some complex. And, and it was just sort of, you know, for me as a first year grad student, it, it felt sort of, miraculous that you start with this thing that's about distributed multiprocessors, you know, with actual blinking lights, and it, it felt like this very applied problem. You, you, you go to write down what the condition for solvability is, and, you know, and there are these theorems from algebraic topology that just fit, fit beautifully, not, not because you reached into algebraic topology and built your system with that in mind, but, but because it, it was the explanation. And I think that, 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 that happens surprisingly frequently in, in computer science, and it's, <clears throat> it's sort of one of the things I think makes, makes us feel 
that somehow this progression is on is on the right track. That you know that, that there's this robust interaction that 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 frequently produces these surprising, kind of aesthetically stunning, and very useful payoffs. We thank you. We we now have another question that's coming. We have two more, in fact, and I I think both of them are crackers. So so we'll try and squeeze them both in. Um, so the, the first one says, um, computer science started in math departments. Is math now being swallowed by computer science departments? If so, how? And is it a problem? Can I start? Absolutely. You know, mathematics has her own agenda, but it has always been a service science also. You know, physics uh, had a great positive influence on development of mathematics for a long time. You know, it was a light in the road. And now I see something similar, um, you know, computer science and biology. And, well, I will say the part of biology, which is also computer science, has huge influence on mathematics. You know, it inspires problems. I don't see any problem, you know, computer science department is our best friend, but mathematics is not only computer science. It's a, we also collaborate with medical school and statistics, uh, with physics and so on. So we have, we have got one friend more. And I completely agree. I mean, uh, it's not we are not swallowed by CS departments. Of course, CS departments are, are growing because of the, you know, the big number of applications that we are seeing in our societies. Uh, but uh, still, you need math anyhow in academics, and uh, you know, we we interact with many many departments. So it's not a problem, as as Evan says. It's one more friend in, inside the university. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. Um, you know, I think obviously computer science departments are growing, right? There's applications, there's student demand, but, but I, I haven't in the last couple of decades seen, <clears throat> seen as in I've seen this productive uh, interaction, but, but math departments have retained their distinctness in, in every sense of the word, certainly. Okay. And then the uh, potentially the final question, I guess it depends how long it takes you to answer. Um, it, so it's a very good question. Um, so computer science and respectively mathematicians, is there a result from the other subject that particularly fascinated or delighted you? Hmm. Okay. You know, in computer science inspired mathematics, I was very fascinated by the results on expanders that Madhu have, has already mentioned. I am fascinated on results in linear algebra, you know, good ways to multiply matrices. Um, and now I'm very excited by the problem of, say, uh, solving huge systems of linear equations with sparse matrices. In my case, I remember the, the example that I really liked because it's very easy to understand. I mean, okay, easy not in, uh, in five minutes, but uh, uh, it was about uh, the, the basic uh, cryptography algorithms, which are really based on, you know, um, this idea of, uh, um, I mean, these are theorems about congruences. I mean, these are very classical results in algebra from the 17th century, but the moment you see it applied and they, they explain to you a very concrete problem, right? You have the usual example, Alice and Bob, that they want to communicate. And then you have uh, uh, Evi who is listening to every conversation and then you need to pass a message back and forth. And how do you do that? It looks like, you know, a problem that you can say to a kid, like, uh, you know, very, and uh, it looks that there is no solution, right? And then, uh, you know, the, the idea of, of the, that came starting in the 60s and moved on was really how to take some, the intuition of how to use very classical theorems and put them together to really solve something so concrete. So, okay, here is still a mathematical result, but I mean, really, 
computer scientist who found this, uh, you know, very smart idea of implementing uh, math theorems in, in such a problem. So uh, that's an example that I liked a lot. I guess yeah, computer me. scientists, any, <clears throat> any mathematical results that have particularly what? delighted or fascinated you? Uh, I mean, there were a lot of uh, a lot of results that uh, I could I could try to point to. That I mean, there are some from the distant past. You know, things I, I learned as an undergrad um, that you know are sort of the sort of the reflection of this. They're 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 mathematical results that fundamentally have a computer science feel to them. So you know, things like um, the insolvability of the quintic by radicals, for example, is you know, ultimately a statement about the impossibility of, you know, because obviously this quintic equation has, you know, has roots or it doesn't and they, you know, and, you know, but, but, but it's, it's a statement about constructability within a particular model of computation, right? By straight line programs that start with the coefficients and are allowed to add, subtract, divide, multiply and extract radicals. And, 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 and so it says, let's define that as our model of computation. And, you know, in that sense, it's reminiscent of the impossibility of certain compass and straight edge constructions, which says, I'm going to define a constrained model of computation and say certain things are achievable and certain things aren't. And I think, you know, what I found, you know, striking about those as an undergrad that already was an interest in computer science is that, you know, computer science aspires to prove statements like that. It wants to say, you know, our constrained model of computation is polynomial time. And the problem of deciding whether a graph has a clique on half of its vertices is the problem we'd like to solve within this constrained model. You know, and ultimately that's the P versus NP question. And it's a, you know, it's a much, much more difficult version of some of these impossibility results for stylized models of computation. So I think there is this, this lineage in math, which is very elegant, that points to sort of carving out a stylized construction procedure and then talking about what it can and can't achieve that I, I, I find very elegant. I personally find uh, results where I can find, you know, a system of uh, uh, constraints has a solution to be fascinating and uh, includes, so in my uh, own work, I often encounter results which say how many uh, zeros can a collection of polynomials have simultaneously and then things like Visu's theorem in the plane or whale bounds and so on. These are extremely, uh, you know, they're just stunning, they're beautiful, they're, you know, smack on. This is exactly the question we often wanted to ask and answer and lead us to some wealth of wonderful algorithmic uh, implications also. Um, I also find, I mean, you know, you could sort of extend this to when does a given matrix have a real eigenvalue or in the recent theory of uh, that resolved the Cadison singer conjecture, uh, you know, when do, do these interlacing polynomials, what, what are the system of zeros or real stable polynomials? So there have been uh, lots of wonderful encounters between computer science and mathematics. And I've sort of tried to move along with the drift in computer science as it goes from one area of mathematics to another. And it is just amazing that uh, the, some of these questions that you know, we eventually managed to morph into something that's uh, well studied, finds such a stunning answer. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for sharing your uh, your delightful theorems from, <laughs> from the other branch. Uh, always nice to hear the, the respect, of course, as, as has been mentioned by, by quite a lot during the discussion between mathematicians and, and computer scientists. Really great to see. Um, and that just about brings us to the end um, of the discussion. So uh, it just leaves me to say thank you once again to all of our uh, fantastic panelists, uh, Alessio Fugali, Madhu Sadan, Efim Zelmanov, and John Kleinberg. Um, and thank you to everybody uh, for, for watching and joining us um, for the discussion and for sending in all of your brilliant questions. Um, in terms of admin for the, for the closing now of the, uh, the virtual uh, Heidelberg Laureate Forum for this year, so you will receive uh, a new agenda item in your app, which will uh, set, take you to the closing ceremony, uh, which will be a series of videos uh, from the, the board of directors. Um, and there will also be a virtual reality flash mob taking place at quarter past the hour. So in 35 minutes, you can watch in virtual reality a flash mob uh, happening in the, uh, the interactive app platform, which I'm sure will be uh, very exciting. 
Uh, so again, thank you very much. I think we can all, I can at least, I know you can probably only see me, but I'm giving you all a round of applause and I'm sure the, the rest of the audience are as well. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for, for your thoughts. Thank you everyone for joining us. And um, thank you for, for a great uh, virtual forum. Thank you, Tom. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Tom.